comfortable. Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Huh? Sometimes people call me a futurist. Never ever believe someone who even claims that he or she can predict the future. No one can. But I really believe that together we can co-create the future. And that's what I would like to discuss today. I'm going to show you a few things, maybe a number of unknown unknowns, which might help to drive a super aspirational roadmap to make Europe that healthiest kind of continent of the planet. I'm trained as a molecular oncologist. I have dealt with cancer patients. More confronting than a six-year-old child with brain cancer, it will probably never get. And my world changed completely when I came for the first time in some part of China, where close to 3,000 years ago, a system existed in which the clinician, the doctor was paid to keep people in the village healthy. And once you got sick, you no longer had to pay. That blew my mind. That still blows my mind. That is, in my opinion, the ultimate outcome-based, value-based healthcare. And I made up my dream, trying to build together with you a world in which our grandchildren no longer need to get sick. And that's what we're going to try to do, right? OK. Now, why did we lose that kind of Chinese model? I couldn't explain it better than what Moliere once said. Moliere said, well, we doctors, we use drugs we know a little about. We buy them from pharma companies. Trying to cure diseases we know even less about to help patients we know nothing about. With all respect, your doctor knows nothing about you. And let me try to illustrate that. If I send a package from here in Brussels to Barcelona, I go to the website of TNT, UPS, FedEx, and I can trace my package every five minutes, right? Which I find absolutely normal. When my kids didn't receive their package during Corona in time, they completely freaked out. My average patient, my cancer patient, my Alzheimer's patient, my diabetic patient, is 8,755 hours a year by himself, by herself, not connected to me as a healthcare provider. So a FedEx package is better than my patients. That's not normal. And that's what we're going to change. We're going to build a healthcare system where we will be able to be present 24-7 with our patients today, with our citizens tomorrow, so that we can start to think about mimicking that Chinese doctor from 3,000 years ago. And that's what we're really going to build together. We're going to try to find a way to clone the, well, the analog real doctor from 3,000 years ago into a digital copy, into an avatar of ourselves. And for that, I'm going to try to introduce three, I call them guardian angels, right? Three sets to collect data, to bring them together, and to really represent who I am, who you are, into a digital twin. Now, just to make that, that word avatar kind of human, look to this. This is, to me, the, one of the coolest hospitals I've seen. It's in Helsinki. Is anyone from Helsinki here in the house, by any chance? This is a children's hospital in Helsinki. And when you walk into the hospital, the first thing you see is a huge container. I mean, an aquarium, that one. And in the aquarium, you see fish swimming around. And the fish are, well, drowned by children, which upload the fish into a tube system. And it comes into kind of the bowl, right, the aquarium. I call that delight, right? It's not a gimmick, but the cool thing is the following. If I enter the hospital, it's no longer Kuhn Kass who is entering the hospital. I can pick an avatar out of a huge series. I can pick to be the strongest rabbit of the planet with the biggest ears, with the strongest teeth, right? And when I come to my floor to see my doctor, he or she is not calling Kuhn Kass. He's calling the strongest rabbit with the biggest ears, with the biggest. And I'm destigmatized. My avatar becomes my second me, right? That's what we're going to build together. So I'm going to introduce three kind of guardian angels. I think for this audience, this is the first slide which I could have skipped, but I didn't do that. Because I would like to ask you, by the way, yesterday was DNA day, you know? Do you know what the left picture depicts? Yeah, absolutely. But the thing here in the front, it's a hard disk. IBM, 1954. It required the plane to get transported, right? The, uh, the hard disk in your smartphone is one billion times cheaper, smarter, more powerful. 
until a few years ago, that was the fastest technological development ever made by man. Our ability to increase computer power every 18 months, no longer so. Our most advanced technological feat developed by men and women is our ability to identify our 3 billion digits genomic code, no longer for $3 billion in 10 years' time, but with this device, which you see at the right, in three hours' time for close to something like 750 euro. The question is not, well, can we do that and who will pay for that? The question is, how will Europe deal with that, right? Just for my information, who of you is already fully sequenced? Who knows his full genome? No, that, that cannot be not anyone. But this tells you something, right? Okay, let me explain why I think it becomes ethically unacceptable not to be sequenced. This is my father. A few years ago in the uh, intensive care, double infection of the lung. And what people then do, they take some liquid out of the lungs, grow it on a petri plate, hope that bacteria grow. Okay, better? Okay, I'm sorry. My father, double infection of the lung, people take out some liquid out of the lungs, put it on a petri plate, and hope that bacteria grow to decide which antibiotic to give, right? After three days, nothing was growing. So the guy was ready to die. We took this device, took some liquid out of the lungs, sequenced every bacterium into the lungs, compared it against the database of every bacterium ever seen, and in three hours' time, we had the right antibiotic. That's from three days to die to three hours to treat, which is better, which is personalized pet scene, right? What does it take to get that in your clinic? Huh? What does it get to, well, you start using that? This is the second example. The state of Hawaii, pretty impressive. The state of Hawaii sues two of the biggest pharma companies on the planet because they bring a blood thinner to the market in Hawaii, just like they do in the rest of North America. People in Hawaii, they have three digits out of the three billion, which make that the blood thinner, Pavlix, what's it called in the time, is degraded faster, it's metabolized faster. If something gets metabolized faster, you need more, right? And so Hawaii managed to Sanofi and BMS to get the subscription based on the genome of kind of inhabitants of Hawaii. Imagine you come in my ICU, in my ER, and I give you a blood thinner, there is 6% chance that you do not leave my ER, you're dead. Because I couldn't dose it right, because I didn't know your genome. That's ethically unacceptable, right? By the way, you could argue, well, why should we even bother if we cannot do something about it? This is the solution. This is the very first 3D printed pill. It's not produced in bulk. It's produced by a 3D printer. Comes out the machine, it's based on my genome, and I can dose the pill, concentrate the drug higher or lower. When I showed this for the first time to UCB, this is a UCB, it's an epilepsy drug, I guess they have fired six people not being aware that this is where pharmacy might go to as well. By the way, you've seen this. Huh? As a cancer patient, I'm not waiting for you to treat me. I find you. This is a website which allows me to type in my mutation, and I find every single clinical trial on the planet ongoing to treat me. That's something you know. But look to this. This is fascinating. This is Singapore. Singapore, which is like Flanders, Singapore has built a deal with Molecular Match and now has Oncoshot and helps you to find a treatment for cancer somewhere on the planet. That's what I love my country to do for me. Right? It's not me who has to find it. You have to bring it to me. By the way, if I tell my patient I can look to the chance that you get colon cancer, my patient says, well, Mr. Kass, I'm not so much interested because you're going to put kind of this tube in the back of my body. We no longer do that. We now have these tiny pills, which are 360-degree cameras, which I swallow, get through my GI, make better pictures than I did in the past, and make that one in five doctors turn into four in five patients. One in five turn into four in five saying, yes, I want to know. The initial pill was made by Medtronic, right? Medtronic now has a deal in the US, guess with which company to bring the pill home. It's OTC with Amazon. You can order just like you order a book, you can order a pill to watch your guts. I mean, that's personalized healthcare. 24 seven, it's with me. And if you don't like that, this might be an alternative. This is a man's cave in a, in a, in a, in a hospital in Harlem. 
It's designed with all the paraphernalia from my favorite sports team to get men into the clinic to get prostate or colon cancer testing. I find that delightful. It's turning around the model so that I look forward to deal with health. Now, obviously, and that's my job, I got myself sequenced first time something like 12 years ago. And to be honest, every week I understand less about myself. The complexity of genome, it's harder than we ever anticipated. I mean, and with genome, I mean every level, level eh? transcriptome, metabolome, whatever. But I'm going to give you one example. Well, maybe two. Did it for myself. I get blind. I don't know when. But I'm predisposed to get it's a disease called macular degeneration, where the back of my eye will degrade. And nevertheless, I am happy to know. Because since I know, I take one supplement, which is something you can buy at the pharmacy, which basically is what you find in, um, in, um, in spinach and in, in carp, and basically it's ultra present in the macula, in the back. So this should help, well, delay degradation, one. But it really got exciting when five years ago, the first piece of software came to the market, which no longer requires me to go to an ophthalmologist, but allows me to use my smartphone to scan my eye, to look into my retina, to see the small, tiny vessels, and to see whether something starts to go wrong. If I know in time, the drug which is out there will function. If I wouldn't know, the drug which is out there will be too late and I'll get blind. So I feel super privileged that knowing what is possible, well, helps me to be in time to predict my disease from striking, right? I would like everybody to have that luxury. I mean, you want to have that luxury as well, right? And by the way, if I turn blind, this is what I'm going to use. This is Be My Eyes. This is an app. You can download it tonight as well. And I advise you to do that. Blind people do have a smartphone as well, believe me. Eh? And if there is a place where I come and I cannot see well, but I need something of help, I point my smartphone to what I not see. And I have on average 12 to 20 buddies, friends, who are willing to receive a notification from me. Can you please help to explain whether the blue scarf fits to my blue shirt? you will feel fantastic if you get the first call asking you, can you please help me? It still gives me goosebumps each time I do that. It's personalized healthcare. It's 24 seven if someone present with me, right? I'm still with you, eh? Okay. Now, again, for this audience, I don't have to explain that that genetic thing is only super, super, super tiny, 20% of the entire story. Eh? The majority of who defines who I am, is not defined by my genome. It's my lifestyle, it's my environment, and big time, my social determinants of health. By the way, 2022, what, is the, no, what are the two most determining factors which will define how old you will get? So it's not DNA. More specific, yeah. It's the age your parents will have when they die, so that you know which you can hire. And it's your zip code, your postal code. This is Chicago. This is the, the tube in Chicago. The average life expectancy, dependent on the suburb where you live, the zip code, is seven years and a half. That's the social determinant of health, right? If I tell my patient, you should walk more, you should go outside and exercise more, Fine, but trust me, they will not do that in this street. What is wrong in this street? The lights are broken, right? That's a social determinant of health. So if I know this, I call the city and tell them, can you fix the lights? Because my patient is not able to walk. That's a social determinant of health, right? And so there's so many. And therefore, I think we need a citizen. We need everybody to collect these things. This is PSOCAST. And PSOCAST basically allows me to collect super tiny and accurate, well, weather data for me as a psoriasis patient, because I know, or for a uh, rheumatoid arthritis patient, because I know I get flares if the temperature goes one degree up or down. If I get stressed, something happens. So can someone help me collect the data and basically help me to kind of prevent? And in this kind of realm, believe me, every single measurement your doctor performs on you, you will be able to perform yourself, if you like, at home. 
with something on your smartphone or something linked to your smartphone. You don't have to, but you can do it. And that is one of the challenges I think we have. That is the unknown unknown, things where people say, well, I didn't know it existed. How do we bring this to the general public? Look to this one. This is a simple app which allows me to measure the energy level of my mass, um, multiple sclerosis patients by seeing how he or she is getting better or worse in typing. That data point is super important because it allows me to kind of adapt medication level or to see that something as a flare will happen again. And so I can, well, get into the life of my patient and all of a sudden by a simple type corrector, type piece of, well, um, influence and personalize his health. And so when we started to talk about these things, people said, well, where should we find all this stuff? This is where you should find all the stuff. My team curates every single digital health tool on the planet which is certified. That's not a huge list. It's only 270 apps. But at least try to, well, look to a number of them and use them in your own life as a doctor, as a hospital, as a nation. Because slowly, this will start to help to complement basically things like eh, my genome with things which are easier to accept and adapt using something on a device which is always in your pockets. And that is okay, only that when we started to show these things to doctors, they said, well, I'm not interested in these apps. First of all, I have enough to do, and if these data are collected at home, I don't trust these data. So this is the solution. This is a scale from Whittings. You can buy the scale at Dixon, at Standard Burner, at Media Markt, at whatever kind of electronics retailer in your country. But since here, a Whittings scale can be uploaded, well, the data can be uploaded in my medical records in the hospital, and all of a sudden, the doctor is interested because he can start to follow me at home and see whether I progress in proper direction. This is body scale. Body scale will be launched in three months from Whittings as well. It measures your heart rate. It measures neuropathies by keeping a bar in your hand certified. I mean, this is something which prevents Parkinson's at home. That's where all of a sudden I get interested because doing this, we now have data. This comes from the fastest growing digital health company on the planet, Omada, that using a scale, how basic can it be? And using human coaching, not avatars, not machines, but human coaching, I can change behavior of lifestyle, of eating behavior in less, less than six months and do it in a permanent fashion by really motivating people who are wanting to, wanting to be helped to be put on a scale and to say, well, on the gram, well, you can do better. Or I find a way to compensate whatever that tricks by something else. You might argue that's freaky. Well, if in six months' time, all of a sudden, for, well, the next part of my life, I get a better life, I think a patient is interested in that. And therefore, let me show you a few things which are feasible now. This is Clue. And Clue allows me to look to how I move my wrist and define what I'm drinking. This is coffee. This is tea. This is a soda. And this is wine. You see my point, eh? Based on my wrist movements, I can tell what my patient is drinking. Freaky? Well, this was acquired by Medtronic. Medtronic is building a lifestyle program to treat people with diabetes and to revert diabetes back to pre-diabetes. Not with pills, not with machines, but with lifestyle management. Well, then I need insight. And if this is something I don't want to give as a patient, fine. But we're going to have a balance eh, where we have 24-7 data sharing, fine, I can help you. If not, I cannot help you. We find something in the middle. Let me come back to that in a second. By the way, this is a really cool application. I can now go to a restaurant to a menu card, can scan the menu card, and with an augmented reality kind of tool, I can see which plates maybe are not made for me. I don't have to think about, does it contain X or Y? Well, the tool finds it out. That's ultra-personalized 24-7 medicine, right? It's based on tech, which becomes an enabler to make my life, well, smoother. But the real exciting thing is this one. A few years ago, 
We've sent, well, we split 6,000 diabetic patients in two teams, 3,000, 3,000. And we gave them an ultra accurate step counter. How basic can it be? A step counter. And we proved that half of the team had 3,000 people who did an extra 2,000 steps a day. Two years later, we're not getting more sick, sometimes cured, and the disease basically reverted back to prediabetes. This was the first proof that maybe exercise is the best treatment I can prescribe to my patients. Well, it's one of, right? Something as basic as that. And then I hear you think, yeah, sure, we know, but no one will listen to that kind of freaky, kind of nudging, boring advice. Therefore, we find solutions. This is Netflix. I guess the majority of you has a Netflix account, right? Pretty soon, you will be able to program the favorite character from your favorite series as a coach on your smartphone. And only if you walk enough, you will be able to see the next episode of your favorite series. That's pretty cool. We have seen that script game too. They haven't. We are healthier. They're not. We have an extra experience. They're not. You see my point, eh? We're going to make healthcare delightful. We're going to make a healthcare system where people say, well, I want to be part of that kind of system. And yes, we need to have the balance right. This is a project we do with a big pharma company in China. Who has already been playing with these loudspeakers from Amazon or from Google or from um, Apple? It's, it's a search engine. Right? So instead of doing search by typing, you ask the simple loudspeaker, when does my meeting start tomorrow? What's the climate in Barcelona? Who was the second president of the United States? Whatever. I talk, right? So if I talk, I can analyze voice data. We now have data which show that people with the Parkinson's, they start to pronounce their vocals differently two years in advance. I find my Parkinson patient by listening to my, we need to get it right, right? But bear with me, there is nothing I do not find to be able to measure. And yes, I think that we then have to start thinking about doing something with this data. Eh? And let me give you this as an example, and you can download that tonight as well. This is my PSI. I mean, Sometimes I'm anxious. Sometimes I don't dare to do things. But getting to a PSI, very hard. Six months waiting time, something like that. This is Rubot. I don't know whether it's he or she, but Rubot is on my smartphone. And I talk with him, her. And if I'm anxious or I'm doing something well, not perfect, well, she's with me and gets me through it. And sometimes she convinces me to see a real doctor. But this I like. This is something which allows me to discuss my mental health issues with someone who is always with me, because mental health issues are things I don't even to explain to my wife. And sometimes I have dark ideas I don't dare to tell. And that's also nice. Why this is really personal health. You might have heard from something which is now still a little bit of gimmicky, which is called the metaverse. And the metaverse is kind of an extension of our real world in the digital world. It's nothing new. Your children playing Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, it's kind of the metaverse. Yeah? By the way, we can treat little boys and girls with attention deficit disorders with a game like in the metaverse to bring them to rest. Not kidding. Certified digital therapeutic. But this is virtual. This is a room, a physical room, well, in the digital world, where I can see my counselor. But I don't see my counselor real life. Or I can see other patients. I see them as avatars. And I'm happy to discuss mental health issues with avatars, and they get me through how they manage their disease. They explain me what they did to come to rest. And by the way, you can pick the design of the counseling room. Right? This is one of the things which makes me happy. I'm an art lover, so I can design the room personalized to me as a museum. And the art, the pieces of art on the wall are NFTs, which are pieces of art which I can download basically as digital arts, and they all have to do with resilience, with mental health, and so on, and so on. So you might argue that the good news is that if we will be able to start collecting data 24-7, that we will be able to anticipate things in time, right? And that we can get the biggest friction in sick care out of the way. The biggest friction in sick care is getting sick. And that would be pretty delightful if we solve that, right? But I hear you think from, whoa, 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 whoa. How on earth are we going to deal with privacy, with ethics, and morality? 
Well, let me try to illustrate that. Who of you is willing? Let me see. It's it's Tuesday now. Eh? Yeah. Who of you is willing to explain me or tell me where he or she will be Saturday afternoon at three o'clock? <laughs> Ooh, this is a scary audience. A uh, one. Okay, thank you. One. Yeah, maybe two or three. The majority of you thinks Kun, that's none of your business, right? Well. Who of you has been to Disneyland recently? Well, recently, not the last two years, that was not possible. But to Disneyland in the US. Anyone? Okay, I guess you know what I'm going to tell. Before I go to Disneyland, I get a box sent home. This box with magic bands. Not kidding, that's how it looks. My name, the name of my partner, the name of my kids. I start wearing the bands, I enter the park, and I do not pay. That's the product, wireless payment. Nothing special. You have the same at Tomorrowland of Ping Pop, right? But you know what I hate? When I go to Disneyland with my children, it's waiting 45 minutes in line in front of Avatar. Not nice. Five minutes, two, three. This little band app tells me that if I leave now from where I am in the park to Avatar, there is no line. That's a pretty cool service. I'm willing to give up my exact location at three o'clock because I get more in return. That's the future of healthcare. My patient is willing to share a data point if I'm able to delight him with something in return, right? By the way, we came there in the park and my wife got flowers. My wife got flowers. By the way, we stayed there for two days, so the flowers went in the room. Why did my wife get flowers? I had filled the form with my birthday, the birthday of my kids, and my birthday, my wife's birthday is the 4th of September. We came there the weekend of the 4th of September. The flowers I will never forget. That's the light. I didn't ask to be used for the data point. They used it. I didn't care. You see my point, huh? You shouldn't care. And that's where I'm going to end with. How are we going to bring these things together? Huh? You can tell from my very nice A that I live in the center of the planet. This is my city. This is Antwerp. And part of the city, we are put really into very great detail into a sensor map. Right? We collect, for instance, which plane crosses the city. We collect which air turbines are on. We collect how many people cross red light, orange light. We have these data. Yeah? And these data combined with my sick data, and I apologize because it's in Dutch, but it's weird. In Belgium, we collect our sick data in Mijn Gezondheid. This is my genome, these are my brain scans, this is my voice, this is my social media profile. These data define who I am, right? So what? Well, this is so what? In 2022, if I would work in a company and I would like to build a new car, I will not be able to build a new car unless I can first show that a digital copy of a car, a digital twin, which I can see on my screen, why? because I have so many sensor data from building the car yesterday that my computer can emulate the car, I sh will, will be required to show that I can make the car better, faster, more energetic, first in line digitally before I get money, resources, people, right? You know what my next slide is gonna tell. 2022, for the first time, we are ready to envision digital twins of ourselves, where we start to collect the type of data I've just shown into building our avatars. And you might say, well, Kuhn, that's, that's, that's out of our league. That's, that's not for yet. Well, not for today. Well, incidentally, I was part of a consortium which was called Health EU, which applied to the European Union for a very significant amount, more than a billion, trying to make a digital twin for every European citizen by 2030 which is able to predict the five most common diseases. We didn't get the money, that doesn't matter. We could align 57 teams against that same vision. So I do believe that Europe is ready to get that right. And that's where I'm gonna stop. Because to get that right, I think there's one thing we need. Eh? I wasn't here yesterday, but I heard um, Lin mention that you discussed individual sitting behind his or her data dashboard, right? Now, with regard to data, there is three worlds. There is the US, 
When my data go to Google, Facebook, they built a app model around it, and that's how the world turns. You have China. My data go to the government, and they define how I should live, right? And now we have the European dream. Yes, the European dream that every European citizen should have his or her data. But where is that? This is the first time. And I'm very proud that this comes from our country, from Flanders, from Belgium, built by, by Vito and with four super important organizations around, and, 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 and Jeff is here. This is the first iteration of what I believe will be the new version of the internet. This is a way to give every citizen, patient or not, a personal online data store sitting somewhere in a safe matter in the cloud, which I, me as a citizen, patient, define which data I put in the, in the store, right? Now, I'm going to give you one example, which is already live, tested in a few communities here in, uh, in Flanders. And I'm going to project it on myself. Eh? For instance, I upload a number of things based on the questionnaire, the kind of questionnaire my first-line doctor would ask. By the way, we involved Domus Medica, which is the umbrella organization of medical doctors, just to make sure that they were part of the game. We also, well, we also invited patient organizations to be part of this, just to be clear. But so for instance, I have uploaded a number of data, and then I can define what I have as a concern. For instance, I have fears. I have a number of mental things which are not right. And at that point in time, my data gets anonymized. It's no longer Kuntas, it's anonymous data. And someone can come knock my personal data store door. And I get a little email saying, Kun, we are a mindfulness, we are a yoga club, which is two blocks down from where you live. In two weeks, we have an open door. You're welcome, we invite you to come and see us. All of a sudden, a service which might solve my needs comes knocking my door. I'm allergic to whatever things with lactose. I don't want to go to my retailer to pull out the last two whatever and to scan every single package to see where it's lactose free. We envision a future where Cora at the last whatever kind of big retailer Walmart, which knows my buying behavior, is having access to my data store, knows that I'm allergic to X, and from now on, each time that I enter the store, will prevent me from buying a product I'm allergic to. That's the light. I no longer have to think. The data thinks for me, right? You cannot be against that. And so for that reason, I'm going to send you home with one task. I think that changing the world is not about technology. Technology is an enabler, right? I think changing the world is about giving the people a vision which they didn't realize they could get. And that's what I illustrated here. This is my birthday wish list. If you give me a little package which is on my wish list, I am happy, right? But if you give me something I didn't realize it exists, I'm super happy. Based on unknown unknowns, you, in your organization, whether you're a hospital, a government, a nation, a doctor, a person who has a partner and a child, gives you a way to be out of everybody's league. So I'm going to send you home with one question. What are you going to do in your organization, eh? in your kind of environment, to go to